Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, a teacher of the law. He, he was a religious hotshot in his day. And he came to Jesus secretly. Some people say because maybe he wanted to hide it. Others have said because he wanted some undivided attention from Jesus. I can see where both could be true. He came to Jesus by night and he sat down with Jesus and really wanted to get to the heart of what was going on. And he starts off with Jesus by saying, Rabbi, we know that you can't do the works you're doing unless you've been sent from God. He acknowledges the miracles had come from God. He said, this, this has convinced me, basically. But he had some questions and doubted it. And Jesus brought it all to a head by telling him, if you're not born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. In fact, if you didn't remember that, that's where we get the phrase that we are born again Christians. That we have been born again because Jesus used that to describe this process of change that went on in a, in a person's life. And naturally, Nicodemus was confused by that, as a lot of people today would be. When you tell them born again, maybe they, weird things come to their mind. They don't know what we're talking about. And, and Jesus went on to explain that basically we're born of the water, but we're born of the flesh. We're born for the first time as a baby. Then we're born again, but we're born by the Spirit. We become a new creature in Jesus Christ. And of course, Nicodemus then wondered, how can these things be? And that's the text we're looking at today, there in John 3. We want to first start off there with verse number 15. I will go back to verse 14 and following there. Stand with me, please, as we read God's Word in John 3, 14 through 21. It says there, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so was the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the famous verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. May God bless the reading of His Word. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to begin where John 3.16 begins. I want to look at God's love. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world. It's a love that led Him to action. Basically it's saying God loved us. And God's love caused God to take some, some actions there. He looked at mankind, even when we were his enemies, and said, I love you. Really, the scripture is filled with examples of that. But God did something special at the beginning of the New Testament. Because you see, basically God reached down and not just said, I love you. He loves us unconditionally and he sent his son for us. And we'll look at more in just a moment. In fact, 1 John 4, 8 says, he who does, he who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Love is God's nature. Love is who He is. If we have traits that people know us for, sometimes they'll, they'll, start, they'll start tying us in with that trait. If we're obnoxious, they'll start saying, James is obnoxious. If we're loud, they'll say, my brother Joel is loud. I've never claimed to be loud, but my brother Joel, we called him Babu growing up. If you remember that cartoon, the little guy walked up the side of the mountain and go, ba-boom, and it blow a hole in the mountain? We accused Joel of that. Naturally, he accused me of being just as loud, but I won't, I won't claim that title. You, you get known by your traits, right? You understand what I'm saying? God is known by being love. He is love. He unconditionally loves us. And that love led him to do this action. I came across another story that illustrates it pretty well. There was a, a grandfather that was over at the house visiting with his, his family there and with his daughter and, and her son and his grandson. And his grandson was just jumping up and down in the playpen, crying at the top of his voice. And so Grandpa walked over, reached down to pick up the baby, and uh, the mother said, no, you, you can't get out of the pen because you're being punished. Remember the little toddler, you know, he, he got into what's supposed to, he had to spend a little time in the pen. 
And now his grandfather is caught. With, he's caught in a dilemma. He loves his kid. His kid's reaching into his heart, crying out, wanting to get out. And it, Mama says he can't. So the grandfather did the only thing he could. He crawled over and got to play playpen with the kid. That way he got to have his grandpa time, and yet he, had to, he got to live by the punishment. That's what God did when Jesus came to this earth. He loves us. He knew we could never reach up to Him. We can't get rid of our punishment on our own, so He took on flesh and came down to this earth and was born as Jesus Christ. He loved us so much, He sent His Son to this earth. His Son took on flesh. He left heaven. All of the deity of God was contained in one human body. He gave up a lot when He did that. No longer was Jesus everywhere at once like God is. He was now in one human body. And think about it. He went through all the stages of development just like every other human being does. He experienced the helplessness of being an infant. Totally dependent on his parents and those around him for everything. I remember when Emma was a baby. It was a big deal the first time she rolled over by herself. Now how many of you look at your husband or wife and think it's a big deal when they roll over today? Why was it a big deal? <laughs> I saw that hand. You're going to pay for that later. Why is it a big deal? Because a baby is their first time, especially on your firstborn child. It may not be quite as big a deal <laughs> the more children you have or whatever, but we celebrate that. We celebrate the first time they roll over, the first time they sit up. Jesus had to go through all those things. It's hard to think about. At, at one moment, there's a little bit of He's God, and I don't know how much he was aware of, of all that at that moment, but he had to experience the helplessness. He had to struggle with learning to walk. You ever seen kids learning to walk? It's not a pretty sight sometimes. You wonder how they're going to survive those toddler years. They're running into everything. They're, they're hurting themselves. They're falling down. And some people go to the extreme of making them wear little helmets all the time because, because of the cause of it. They, they, they're scared to death to put elbow pads and knee pads and helmets on because they know they're going to fall down all the time. And it seems like right when they're in that most awkward stage, if they can climb, they climb the top of trees and things. They just go, they don't have any fear, so they'll go where they shouldn't. Jesus had to go through that. Imagine learning to talk. Hearing his God who said, let there be light, and boom, the universe is filled with light. And he, he couldn't even say water. He couldn't even say mama and daddy. He had to learn to express himself in human terms. All those years of being a child and everything that goes with it, the joy of, of, of growing up and the, the, that and the pain of having to do chores, and kids think they have it rough now. Really, in these modern times, they don't know what rough is. As a, as a carpenter's son, Joseph being his earthly father, he learned carpentry from a young age. As soon as he could hold anything in his hand, a piece of sandpaper, he was out there probably sanding it. He was out there helping tend the gardens that they had to have, not just for fun of saying they grew their own food, because if they didn't grow it, they would die. You look at, it, that happened up to, you know, just a couple hundred years ago is when they started maybe phasing out where children were a vital part of keeping the family going. They had to help out. School, a lot of our habits today and our timing of when we have school has to do with when they'd be most busy on the farm. And that you'd expect that. You're aware of that. He had to go through those years. Then he went through the troubled and dangerous waters of being an adolescent. He had to go through all the different changes in his body, the mind changes, the, the, the chemicals in his body. He had to experience all that. And he had to do it at the same time knowing he was God in the flesh. Because it, when he was 12 years old, kind of... It's not a set date, but maybe kind of a, in the Jewish mind, that's when they quit being a child and became a man, basically. He had to present himself at the temple. He went down there, and remember, his parents left. He had traveled with the women going down as a child, and he was supposed to travel home with the men going home. And they didn't realize for a couple of days that he wasn't with them. Evidently, Joseph forgot. Jesus is supposed to be next to me as I'm going home now. They went back, and where'd they find Jesus? He was in the temple teaching the, the preachers teaching the priests and the rabbis and the, and the Pharisees. And when they asked him about it, he said, I had to be about my father's business. Remember, Joseph's the carpenter teaching the word of God. It's obvious at 12 years old, Jesus knew he was God's son. Maybe Mary had told him, maybe he knew it because of his 
just his spirit within him, but he knew he was God the Father's son. And there he is going through being a teen and becoming a man at the same time knowing he was God in the flesh. In fact, the Bible says in love he got this playpen with us and went through everything we go through. He faced every temptation we face. And yet he did one thing different. He chose to obey God in every situation. He didn't sin. Jesus did that. Because of him being God in the flesh. In Romans it calls him the second Adam. He was the only person born without a sin nature. Like Adam was created and had no sin nature but had a choice and he chose to sin. Jesus was born with no sin nature and had a choice and he chose not to sin. Because he was God in the flesh he had the strength and he did that and he then was able to know what he did. He got in the playpen with us. That's love. To set aside that, that power, to set aside that prestige, that place of honor, that place where angels just go at your every thought and do what you have won't done. You speak worlds into existence. And to go through being a human being, that's love. And it's what he did next, actually, that even shows his love even more. Because it says there, he sacrificed. Jesus didn't just... God just didn't love us enough to send Jesus to be here. Jesus sacrificed. God gave us His Son. He offered His Son up as a sacrifice for our sins. C.S. Lewis says it this way, God who needs nothing loves into existence holy superfluous creations in order that He may love and perfect them. That's us He's talking about, by the way. We really didn't have to be here. God just did it because He loved us. He creates the universe already foreseen or should we say seeing, the buzzing cloud of flies upon the cross, the flayed back pressed against the uneven stakes of beams, and the nails driven through the nerves of his hands, the repeated torture of the back and arms as it is time after time, for breath's sake, pitched up and down. Herein is love. This is the diagram of love he gave himself. In verse 14, there Jesus refers back to an Old Testament thing says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. If you remember that story, it, there's a lot of things that, out of the Old Testament. The first five books of the Bible, as they're writing there, from creation, it gets into Exodus. It becomes the, the path of Israel as they go from being slaves in Egypt to being a nation of their own in the Promised Land. And during that time, they got to the border of the Promised Land in short order. They had a choice, go in or, or don't. And they feared the giants that were over there. They feared the strong cities and the, the chariots and the armies. And so they said, we can't do this. And God punished them. They said, this whole generation is going to die before you get to come back. And for 40 years, they had to wander around in the wilderness. 40 years, they went around in the desert going in circles as that generation died off. And it wasn't just they were going to get old and die. There were punishments along the way. Not because of that one sin. They, they gave a lot of reasons along the way. They griped about God. They complained about the taste of the quail that God had sent. They didn't like the heavenly bread. They got tired of it. Complained wanting garlic, sticks, and onions. They decided Moses shouldn't be the leader. They wanted to rebel. And, you know, tens of thousands died on each of these occasions. On one such occasion where they got to complaining and God sent a punishment... It came in the form of something that's going to strike terror into my sister-in-law's heart. It was snakes. Are you okay? I can talk about it without scaring you. Snakes came in. And they would bite them and they would not just die. It was a tormenting death. In fact, they called them fiery serpents. This just didn't die like you put your veins on fire when they bit you. And they suffered as they were dying. And then Moses, being the great intercessor, begged God for, to forgive them. God forgave, but a lot of times God would stop them. He just stopped the plague straight out. There were times the earth opened up, swallowed people, and God would just close the earth and quit swallowing it. There were times God was so merciful He just stopped it. But for some strange reason, to them, we now know more about it, God told Moses to take brass and make basically a bronze serpent, stick it on a pole in the middle of the camp. And the instruction was, you get bitten by one of these fiery serpents, you look to that snake on a pole, and then God will heal you. <clears throat> so I'm walking along, the snake bites me, I look at it, I'm healed. That's all it took, looking at the serpent, and you get healed. 
Now in verse 14 in John 3, we now know why God told him such a strange thing to do. Because it was a picture of Jesus Christ being lifted up on the cross. And as we'll talk about again in just a moment, looking to Jesus is what brings our spiritual healing. Can you imagine someone though, so, there had to be somebody so stubborn, they said, I'm not going to look at that. It's hurting, they're, they're in pain. Moses, do something else. I, they, that's stupid. I can't look at that to get healed. I wonder how long they held out before they looked up there. There's a lot of people today that hold out their whole lifetime without looking to Christ. In John 3, 14, it says, I'm going to be lifted up just like that serpent was lifted up. The so that I will draw all men to me. He's going to have to be lifted up. It was a prediction of what was going to happen. And a picture of what Jesus would do on the cross at Calvary. He spilled out his life as he shed his blood there for us. Jesus himself said it this way later in John. He said, greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. He went to the cross and died for us. <coughs> God sacrificed because of his love. In fact, if you look at it from God the Father's perspective, God the Father said, I'm going to give you my son, my one and only son, the only son he had born in the human flesh, I'm going to give you my son to kill so that I can adopt all of you into my family. He loved us so much, he said, kill my son so that all of you can be my sons and daughters. That's love. I don't know that I can say sacrifice one of my, I can't say sacrifice one of my children. I would be willing to give my life up maybe for somebody. <coughs> I, I put myself in danger going into fires as a firefighter. It was a calculated risk. I didn't expect to die, though. I thought I could handle it. The one floor in a house that I fell through and then we pulled everybody out because the floor was giving away, I got a little scared at that moment. But you have to say, take them for all you strangers. That's what God did. He loved us so much, He sent His Son to die for us. And His death, basically... It was in the plate being serving the time for our crimes. The punishment that went upon him was to pay our sin debt. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that we might become righteousness of God in him. Jesus became sin, and on that cross, this is a very pretty cross, and I've always liked it every time I talk about the cross, I've just naturally drawn to it. But this is not anything at all like a real cross. It was wood. It was splinters. It was, it was, a, it was a thing. But what, what's special about this is it reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice. And when Jesus was on that cross, God poured out all of His wrath for every sin I've ever done or ever will do. For every sin you've ever done or ever will do. God poured out all His wrath on Jesus Christ on that cross. His only Son. Why? Because He loved us. And through His sacrifice, He paid the requirements Everything it takes to pay for our sin in full. When he cried out at the end, it is finished. He was saying the debt's been paid. Set him free. There is no need today for any further sacrifice. And I'm going to meddle, but that's okay, I'll meddle. There's no need today to go to purgatory after you die and burn off a little bit of your own sins. Jesus fulfilled all that. Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. The thief on the cross, one, one rejected Jesus, one accepted Jesus, and the one accepted him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. There's no room for purgatory where we go pay for our own sins. Because we can't pay for our own sins. And Jesus paid the debt in full. It'd be like if somebody came up and decided to pay off my car payment. The next day be going to the bank wanting to pay my payment. There's no bill to put it to. It's paid in full. And if one of you want to pay my car payment, let me know. I'll give you the details. God did that for us. He loved us so much. He paid our sin debt through Jesus' sacrifice. There is no need for us to do penance here in this life. <clears throat> There's some that have this idea, I've got to pay God back. So I've got to suffer in this life. Some even go so far that they make little whips and they whip their back to make themselves feel pain. And we ought to be upset over our sin. But folks, we don't earn salvation. We don't pay Him back for salvation. Everything that it takes to get us into eternal life was right there on Jesus on the cross. He did it all for us. There's no wrath left. And I tell you folks, that is love. 
That is love. He loved us so much, he sent his only begotten son to die for us. He did that because he loves us. And through that, through that amazing love, we now can know God's salvation. Nicodemus wanted to know for sure he wanted to be in the kingdom. He didn't want to miss the kingdom. I don't know how educated Nicodemus was on what he was really asking about. He may have still thought like the Jews, it's an earthly kingdom. But he recognized Jesus as the anointed one. He recognized Jesus as God's messenger sent to change them. And so in Nicodemus, he tells him, whoever believes on that only begotten will have everlasting life. He said in 15, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In 16, he repeats it. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then in verse 18, he says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he was not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, remember the context. That's why I spent some time setting the stage for the story today in this time of Jesus' life. Nicodemus has some undivided time with Jesus. Nicodemus wants in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, you've got to be born again. He says, how do we get born again? And he says, believe in the only begotten Son of God and you get eternal life. Where's the list of ten things I'm supposed to do? Did Jesus hate Nicodemus? I don't think so. I think he honestly answered Nicodemus' question. If there were five works I've got to do to earn my way to heaven, I think Jesus would have told Nicodemus, number one, do this. Number two, get baptized. Number three, give faithfully to the church. And whatever list we want to invent today, he would have told Nicodemus that. Otherwise, why are we serving somebody who spent this time tricking Nicodemus and didn't tell him the whole picture? This is a witness. This is an encounter of evangelism where Jesus is telling Nicodemus how to get saved. How to have eternal life. Or as Jesus says here, how to be born again. And he says, believe in the only begotten. What is he saying? He's saying, trust me. Put your faith in me and I'll get you to heaven. That's what Jesus was saying. To us, he says the same thing. It's like that serpent that was on that pole. All they had to do was look. It was an act of faith to turn and look there saying, God said if I look there, I get healed. And they had to have the faith to obey God to do that. If God told us to go run a 20-mile marathon to get to heaven, wouldn't you at least try to go run a 20-mile marathon? It'd take me my whole life to get in training for it from where I am right now. But I'd do my best to make it 20 miles if that's what God said it took. So he says it takes trusting him. This is something that I don't know. It's so simple it gets missed by so many people. It doesn't make sense to us humans that it's that simple. What condemns people, he says, those who haven't believed. What gets them saved, those who have believed. That's why I said John 3.16 is really all you have to have to tell people how to be saved. John 3.16 is all you have to have. There's a whole lot of other great verses of Scripture. Please don't make that the only one you commit to your life. But there's a lot of great there. What it says is basically Jesus' mission is to save us. From eternity past, it was already decided by God that God the Son would come to this earth to pay for your sins and for my sins. God, had, God knew He would need a Savior, and Jesus was going to do that. He came to earth to rescue us. In fact, while He was here, Jesus made a play on words and was asking Him why He went and ate the sinners, why He hung out with all these bad people. And Jesus said, the people who are well don't need a doctor, it's those who are sick. In another passage, basically, he's called the great physician. Jesus was there to take care of us in our sin and sickness. He came to cure this disease, this plague that brings about death known as sin. He came to give us eternal life. Jesus gave it to him real simply. Whoever believes in him would have everlasting life. And this is not what I originally came to say, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. What is the definition of everlasting life? What does it mean, eternal? Which is what we use in the verse before the English word translated there. It reminds me, and I may blog about this soon, so if it's in a bulletin insert, you'll see it in the future. But if you remember back in Clinton's days, one of his arguments over whether he lied or not was, what's the definition of is? Well, it depends on the definition of eternal. If eternal means never ending, you don't lose it either once he gives you salvation. And to me, that's what eternal means. Everlasting means it's going to go on forever. It's even better than oh, ever ready money. It's going to go on forever. 
So it's not a matter of me worrying about someday I'm going to get kicked out of heaven. Because nothing can separate me from the love of God, the Bible says. I don't have to worry about that. The pain and suffering and, 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 and all that, that we must endure, where is that? Well, that was on Jesus on the cross. He took the pain. He took the suffering. I heard a story one day about, I, just this morning I saw the news, there are still one-room schoolhouses. In Montana, at least. There, it's about 200 one-room schoolhouses in the United States. Public schools, they have one employee, a teacher. They have K through 8 in all the ones that we're showing today. And one of the kids said he cheated. He was in kindergarten. He was listening to what the third graders did, so he got to skip first grade because he learned so much. But uh, back in the days of the, the old west, the pioneers, as they were going west, they were expanding at just smaller communities. And what we have, we have little one-room schoolhouses, off the top, double as the church had. And for those days, a, a story, there was a little boy there that was sickly and, and hardly ever got to go out to recess, hardly ever got to, to uh, come to school. I mean, he just had a rough time. And he, of course, the little one sat at the front, the little one sat at the back. And uh, this kid messed up in class and he, he was going to get punished. And the teacher hated to do it, but the teacher had to do it. And there was only real one punishment back then. He got the stick out and was going to school. <coughs> A switching there. And that, nowadays, that gets hidden behind the principal's office and people don't even know it happened unless you happen to be the witness. Then it happened right at the front of the class. And I'm not saying we ought to do it at the front of the class, but it did motivate me to avoid it when I saw him more often. But the, the, the teacher didn't want to do it. The boy got up to the front and didn't want to do it. And he was about to, to, to whip him and an older boy from the back stood up. I said, let me take this class. <coughs> And that boy stood between the teacher and the younger student, and all that whipping went to that older boy. And the teacher didn't lighten up on him. Because teachers didn't know how to lighten up back then, I don't think. But that's what God did with Jesus. We don't have to suffer for salvation. We don't have to bear any pain for it. Jesus paid the price. And that's what it is. What do we have us do? We must believe who He is. Basically, we've got to believe He's God's Son, that He's who He says He was, the only God. We've got to believe what He has done. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, a great summary of the whole message of, of Jesus. In verse 1-8, it says, Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand. You are also saved by it if you hold the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe for no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried, that He raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one abnormally born, He also appeared to me. Paul said that that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's the gospel they believe. That Jesus was God's Son and that He died and rose again in their place. And that last thing, really, we've got to trust what He promised us. Just like everybody that was bitten by a snake had to trust looking at that snake would heal me and look up to that bronze serpent. When we look to the cross of Jesus and have faith, when we cry out, Save me! We have to believe that He'll answer that. We have to believe He will save us. We've got to trust Him. And that, that salvation He brings transforms us so much. It brings us to life. It gives us that eternal life. Love's eternal. Feel it. Well, when you talk about it like this, it's really not a feeling, is it? I would edit that. I'd say love's eternal experience. Receive it. Because really it's so much more than just a feeling, isn't it? I don't do this often. <coughs> But I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning as we prepare for a time of decision. <laughs> I don't know how you are today. I don't know if you've already received the love of Christ into your life and you know what it is to have eternal life or if that's something you're still searching for this morning. No matter how young or old you are, there's no limit to the need to reach out to the Savior and accept His forgiveness. And I just want to encourage you right now, if you've not been born again, and you feel God saying, this is the time, then would you ask Him right now to come into your life? 
Just ask Him to forgive your sins and give you that everlasting life. To look to Him and trust Him. As we sing in a moment, I want you to come and I'll share with you how you can do that. I'll turn my mic off every time we, we sing because I, if we've got business to do it, just come down here and I'll talk with you about it. If there's anything else God's leading you to do as we sing in just a moment, I invite you to come and, and let me share this with you. This is the most important message you'll ever hear in your life if you're lost today. That God loves you. That He sacrificed for you. And He will save you. Father, into your hands we give this time. I pray your Holy Spirit now will so burden us that we'll, we'll know for sure that we're part of your kingdom. Lord, as, as Nicodemus heard, he had to be born again. Let us realize our need to be born again. And if there's one here who hasn't experienced that second birth, if this is the time and the hour for them, let your spirit knock on their heart's door and let them open it. Give them the courage to ask and to seek that more, Lord. Father, I pray that you'll help us to live this love, that we will give this message to the people around us, that we will share your amazing love with all who we come in contact. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives right now. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Change my heart, O God.